Hi, I'm Tyra G., your host of Frankly Speaking with Tyra G. Welcome again to our virtual, global gathering of phenomenal women, and yes, all of you who love them. You, mothers, daughters, grand and great-grandmothers, fear, fearful and generous, humble and honest in pursuit of new possibilities and purpose. You know, here we dig deep and we come up strong. For those of you listening for the very first time, each month we explore new themes inspired by you. Yes, I I said you. We bravely walk into places where tradition has taught us there are just some things you just don't talk about. Not at this table. And no matter how hard judgment tries to get in, it won't. Beloved, here we live beyond the wreckage. Every week, we experience, educate, encourage, and empower each other. We share some aha moments and stories that have been left in our pockets for too long. Every week, we start right where we are. I am so excited. We're at the end of our 10th month. Did you hear me? 10 months. Yeah, it's proof that dreams can come true. You all know, frankly speaking, with Tyra G was one of my most precious dreams. I thank God for every remembrance of you, your gifts, your ideas, your presence, and your encouragement. They were all gifts that inspired. There were days that I needed them to keep on keeping on. You know I can't do this out without you, right? Thank you so much. You're listening to Radio Fairfax, Fairfax, Virginia, on your TV, computer, or mobile device. And we are webcast worldwide on the internet at www.radiofairfax every Saturday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Should you have that heavy dinner date, don't worry about it. You can check us out on YouTube. Just key in, frankly speaking, with Tyra G. And if you feel like connecting with me, Offline, you know I love it. It's Tyra at TyraGarlington.com. Thank you again for tuning in. And thank you, Courtney Nero, for composing and performing our Frankly Speaking theme song and for naming it, I'm Listening. Our theme these past two months has been courageous conversations. Two big words, one big idea, and sometimes uncomfortable. For us to get a return on our investment in this space, we have to walk in authentically and able to live there vulnerably. We're going to have to be perfectly imperfect to receive and love information about issues that may be uncomfortable to think about, to deal with, to anticipate, and to forgive. We're going to contemplate, evaluate, learn about, be surprised by, and celebrate. However, what we're discovering is information is the best offense and defense. We have had issues and uh, relationships and conversations related to surviving breast cancer, not once, but twice. We've talked about intergenerational caregiving of a loved one with a developmental disability. We've talked about a mother's unwavering pursuit to get her daughter back from sex trafficking. We've talked to the director of Fairfax County's uh, Office to Prevent and End Homelessness. And a, a former incarcerated woman shared her story into her current status as a positive role model and mentor. We're going to watch out for her because she was an inspiration. She's on a positive and wonderful trajectory for the future. We talked about protection and sometimes lack thereof for victims of domestic violence. We talked about mental health issues for young people. What we discovered is courageous conversations are a process they're a result of a process and a journey. They're not an event. It doesn't, they don't always happen when they need to, logically, on time. Sometimes we have to grow into them. However, sometimes courageous conversations happen and stay in our heads and in our hearts. So they actually are dressed in silence. 
We all have times and seasons when it requires courage to not only talk about, but walk into certain topics. And sometimes we let fear and shame and guilt demonize our potential to overcome. But for now, for today, we're pausing in a place where we can be mirrors for one another. Our goal is to better understand topics that don't pop up in polite conversation or at the dinner table. I want to open the door to our common thought space today with some quotes from people who have walked into dark, pla dark places and come up with dark solutions or who have loved others who have done that. I don't know anyone in this world that wakes up and says, you know, I want to be a criminal or oh, I want to be homeless or I want to be an addict. And yet sometimes the unlikely happens. This is from Anonymous in Birmingham, Alabama. She says, I'm a good person. I am a contributing member of society. I'm educated. I have a good job. I make good money. I have wonderful relationships with my loved ones. I'm so completely average. The only thing that sets me apart from other young business professionals that seems to have it all is that I'm addicted to opiates. And the problem is that I tell myself every day it's not a problem because I'm able to carry myself on in a normal way. I'm not a typical addict. I don't steal, lie to borrow money. I don't manipulate people. I don't engage in promiscuous activity. Since it's not ruining my life in the way of major money, legal, or relationship issues, I tell myself it's not ruining my life. Yeah, I'm delusional. Brittany from Tacona, from Tacona excuse me, says, I wish what people understood, I wish that people understood heroin, opiate addiction has no face. It spares no soul. And once it has you in its tight grips, you'll spend your lifetime fighting out of its hellhole. Opiate re withdrawal relieves you of all morale and ethical codes you thought you once lived by and transforms you into a hollow shell of a human spirit you were born with. This drug was beyond a shadow of a doubt the scariest, most difficult drug I've ever had to quit. Margie, who lost her son in 2010 when he was 22. While I, w while I am a mother who lost her son to an opioid overdose, it does not define me or my family. My son still matters even though most people cannot bring themselves to even say his name or recall his memory. I am forever missing my son, Mitchell, and he's my inspiration to wake up and live every single day. We're survivors of one of the worst wars in America. We cry every day. We cry for those that will die today, tomorrow, next week, next month, and on and on. We cry for their families and with their families. We are losing beautiful, creative, and loving people every 19 minutes and over 120 people a day. It seems like no one cares, that there's no outrage. This is a silent killer and not enough noise is being made about the modern day scourge in America. They never intended for this to happen to them. They wish they never would have started. They feel pretty bad about themselves already without judgment from everyone else. They were still good, caring people. Addiction just completely overtook them. Their families are devastated. Their siblings and parents left behind are forever affected, forever touched by this disease. This becomes a family disease once it touches everyone in the family. We're not ashamed. Through their addiction, we continue to love them and forever will.
After the break, we're going to have a courageous conversation with a woman who impressed me the very first time I saw and heard her years ago on TV as Fairfax County's Falch Falls Church Police Department pub Department, I'm going to get this out, Police Department's Public Information Officer. There she was, calm and authentic and experienced. She was a media crisis and emergency risk communications professional. What that meant was she stood in front of the camera and defined for us tragedy, trauma. You will receive many of the qualities and more as she introduces herself after the break. Stay close now. Radio Fairfax is your station, so use it. Listen on your television, computer, or mobile device. Radio Fairfax, what you want to hear, where you want to hear it. And we are back. I am thrilled to have in the studio with me Ms. Lucy Caldwell. Lucy, I like to ask each of my guests to pretend, I like the pretend word, that you are a book in our human library full of surprises and stories and challenges and wins. And I'd like for you just to spend a few minutes speaking an introduction about who you are that would make us want to keep reading your book, reading who you are. Oh, well, gosh, thank you so much for having me today. First, I'd just say that some of the things you were talking about, I really resonate with that, uh, seeing the clients that my organization works with. And I want to remind everybody who's listening that addiction is a disease. It is not a moral failing. And that's one of the huge barriers that we see is that people are afraid to come forward. And if you're afraid to talk about the issue, then you won't seek treatment and you won't seek help. Mm -hmm. Here in Fairfax County, we're very fortunate that we have the programs that we do and that they're supported and they are being funded. So we're trying. So I just wanted to say that first of all. But as far as who I am, well, of course, what I do for a living isn't exactly who I am. But because you spend so much time at work uh, in all these years of being on call 24-7, I'll go into a little about about my work. Mm -hmm. I started about age 25 as a public information officer for the Virginia State Police. They'd never had one before. And one of the main questions they asked me was, Lucy, our people are not used to talking to anybody. They're used to being on the road alone. They pull people over. They help out with accidents and that sort of thing. But how are you going to get them to talk to you? and tell them your, their stories so that you can report on it to the media. And I said, well, I used to be a camp counselor, <laughs> and apparently that cracked them up. So I got, uh, I got the job, um, even though I was quite young, and a lot of other people had master's degrees and mm -hmm. years of TV experience and media experience. But I was a writer. I was always loved to write and always been interested in people. And I think that when you're interested in people, if you do a job like this, you're going to find a way to get other people to be interested too. And in public affairs and in communications, that's what you're doing. You're highlighting the people that are doing the jobs and you're trying to get the public and the residents or the taxpayers to care about them and to care about the job they're doing. So for me, it wasn't about just reporting on an accident or on a crash. It was really trying to find ways to humanize what happened and hopefully eventually prevent that to happening, uh, that tragedy to someone else. But anyway, I stayed I'm there. I'm going to interrupt you yeah. just one second because that is such a perfect segue. I have to always remind myself, we're in Fairfax, Virginia, but we are broadcasting uh, nationally and internationally. And so we can give a little bit of perspective to what it is you do if people can imagine or ever watch the forest fires, mm -hmm. if they ever watch Katrina, the person that stood in front of the camera and interpreted mm -hmm. the visual, the cause and effect, that's who that's what you did at one point in time. Am I close? Yeah. Basically, I would try to get all the information that I could about whatever the incident was. Uh -huh. And we cover about half the state, Okay, actually, here in Virginia. Okay. So it would be anything from a train crash, 
uh, before the NTSB, National Transportation Safety Board, got there, mm-hmm. we had the immediate response. And okay. So we would just try to serve the uh, residents and the media as best we could, giving information that would be helpful to people, um, whatever that might be. And this was the days before computers really sort of took over with email and yeah, yeah, yeah. social media. Yeah. So this was the late 80s and uh, 90s. Mm-hmm. And I did respond to uh, 9-11. We had, uh, very sadly, troopers who were at the Pentagon yes, and yes. trying to help. And so shortly after that, I, I was, uh, I'd been jumping guardrails for a long time, and I was thinking, what do I want to do next? Uh-huh. And after 9-11, there were federal dollars that were allocated to new positions under bioterrorism communications. And so I took a job with the Virginia Department of Health and really working on issues like communicating anthrax, Mm -hmm. uh, smallpox threats, and trying to bolster communications in the D.C. metropolitan region, um, working closely with the medical community, health departments, uh, police, fire and rescue, and really trying to communicate what the messages would be should we have some kind of bioterror incident. So I spent five years doing that. And then uh, around that time, I started getting a little restless, just thinking, well, I feel like a paper pusher. I think I want to get back out there. And so the local police department here in Fairfax County, Virginia, had created a position that was PR and media. And this was about the time that Twitter and Facebook and all that was Came just together. beginning. Yeah, so yeah. I said, well, gosh, I can do that. So uh, they were very nice, and it was a great team of people, and I did that for about eight years. Unfortunately, during that time, uh, our family suffered a a very, very serious tragedy. My son's best friend took his life here in Fairfax County, and there were about seven others at his high school that did the same, and it absolutely changed our lives. He was uh, like my son. I understand. I do. And suicide uh, is, you know, part of what I'm doing now. Yes. Suicide prevention. Yes. And it's just an honor. And I'm very humbled to be serving in this way and to use the tragedy and the experience that happened with us and our family and my son is losing his best friend and to be able to hopefully help prevent other families from going what we went through. Yeah. And I'm very, very fortunate to be in this position where that's not the whole position and job yeah. that I'm in, but it is a part of it. And I partner very closely with people around the state of Virginia, nonprofits, um, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and we work very closely on prevention. And it is absolutely uh, life transforming to be able to use your tragic experience to hopefully help other people. And I I jot down words as I listen to my guests, and I parked on one that you said earlier, which was to humanize. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, too, have lost relatives to suicide. And uh, it's hard to get your hand on humanity in the middle of that. But also to finally evolve to the point where it's a motivator and and to help you translate to other people. It's like now you can be, this probably sounds crazy, but you can be more effective because you've been close. Mm-hmm. But I, I can't, I mean, nurturing your son through yeah. that had to be extremely painful. And what I'm, I just made a note right here is have Lucy back so we can do a show on suicide. Absolutely, so we have we'll a lot do, of great people. We'll do that. Who yeah. have uh, very personal experiences. And I really look up to a lot of them and it's an honor to be involved in supporting their events yes. in supporting regional communications yes. around the prevention issue. The organization that I'm now working for, which is part of Fairfax County, the Falls Church, the Fairfax Falls Church Community Services Board, suicide prevention is part of that. And we fund the PRS Crisis Link, yes, which I is know. the yes. hotline. Yes. And... Sadly, in the last 10 years, the CDC just came out with the most recent report Mm -hmm. about less than a month ago, and it's showing the numbers are skyrocketing. And we have to ask ourselves as a community, as a society, and as a nation, 
what is causing this? Yes. What can we be doing differently? And quite frankly, all of us mm-hmm. need to be prepared for this. And so fortunately, where I am, we have a course called Mental Health First Aid. Anyone can take this course. We go out into the communities, into the schools, into uh, police departments, into churches, and the faith community. And we have a two-day course called Mm -hmm. Mental Health First Aid. And it really tries to um, talk about how to handle a crisis. It seems that so many people, um, you may not have had that thing happen to you yet, but at some point you will. And how are you going to handle that? And Mental Health First Aid is one of those uh, great tools that can add skills and knowledge and education so you can help other people. Would you believe when I was at the county, I took that? Awesome. I did. I did. That's great. And what I loved about it is it was participatory right. and group solutioning, you know, but uh, it became important for you to leave anything but your authenticity at the door and right. your ability to be vulnerable. And I agree it, it should be in everybody's toolkit. You know, mm-hmm. you could be uh, on the uh, subway. Mm-hmm. You could be in a grocery line. And you could be standing next to somebody Mm -hmm. that if you had the right conversation, if you had uh, the right approach, you may save them from a completed. uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I do a lot of thinking about this. And what I wonder is, have we evolved as a society that doesn't fight, doesn't fight anymore to survive, you know, like. I talk to a lot of young people who feel entitled and they tend to give up rather than look for options and alternatives. And I'm not speaking for all by any sense, Uh, but I have heard a lot of stories. Well, you know, uh, well, I'll get married and then I'll get divorced if it doesn't work out. Right. You know, they have that ending solution as -hmm. they begin something. And that always kind of worries me. Absolutely. And suicide is a temporary, it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Absolutely. And so as parents and as aunts and uncles and friends, how and nephews, uh, how are we talking to young people about coping with the downside of life? And I, frankly, a lot of people may not have faith in our society. In the old days, people went to church and they had that as a part of their life. But the truth is, many don't. And so what are we doing in place of that to let people know that this is a tough time, but you're going to get through it? And there is help available. In the CSB, where I work now, we do have resources. We have 24-7 help and resources. The crisis link, the line is is wonderful. Absolutely. Wonderful. We have emergency services Mm -hmm. that if someone is experiencing serious uh, emotional distress, they can come Mm -hmm. and be assessed and our clinicians will help them immediately. And in the end, if the CSB can't be of help, we will connect them with resources. And you mentioned youth and we really are doing a lot with youth. Mm -hmm. We have a new initiative called Healthy Minds Fairfax and we're excited about that because they have various programs under this umbrella of Healthy Minds Fairfax, such as um, you can have up to, if you're qualifying and eligible, you can have up to eight free sessions with a therapist, and you have to meet certain qualifications for that. But um, that's an effort where our Healthy Minds Fairfax team are working closely with the medical community Mm -hmm. and with the psychiatric community. And we're trying to get people to be aware of what the issues are and not to be afraid of stigma to ask for help. And that's exact. I was going there, and it's so so interesting, Lucy. You know, our our format just went out the window. Now we're we're talking about our passion. And uh, to me, however, uh, we're talking about what needs to be talked about. And uh, one of the things that I have discovered, and I'm sure you have as well, historically, I remember uh, I was in graduate school and then I joined the clinical staff uh, at the University of California, San Diego. And it was interesting because I was, in my class, one out of 30 chosen in the United States, but the only African American. And they would ask me questions, well, where do you go? Because we, at that time, resisted 
mental health. Oh, mm-hmm. I'll go talk to a therapist was not the first thing an African American person in the community in trouble would say. Mm-hmm. They may say, I'm going to the barbershop or I'm going to the beauty shop, or I'm going to talk to Aunt Sadie, or I'm going to prayer meeting. But it was not the formal therapeutic structure we have now. Yeah. And uh, there's still resistance. There is. There's and still a lot of resistance to walking in and saying, help me. And we're talking about addiction as well. Yes. And uh, there's a lot of co-occurring disorder. That's yes, what it's that's, called in yes, the business. Yes, yes, absolutely. And those are folks who maybe can't talk to anyone, so they're self-medicating. Yes. And that does become uh, quite uh, quickly, in many cases, substance use disorder. And I know that's one of the issues that you wanted to talk yes, about. Yes, absolutely. So I'm happy and to answer any questions about that. What What I want us to, uh, I want us to create a fabric or a quilt to show that everything we're talking about is interdependent. Absolutely. Okay. So like you just said, if I can't talk to you, if I can't find the words, I might find the pill. Mm-hmm. Okay. What bothers me a lot is the availability mm-hmm. of the pill through, uh, I guess, I don't want to say non-discriminate, but it's easy to get a prescription if mm-hmm. you have a presenting problem that could recur. But then I think about you and I were talking about this young people. Mm-hmm. who are in their parents' medicine bottles, right? not understanding consequences. And they have pill parties. Right. Come on. They just throw a bunch of pills in a fishbowl and just, I, yeah, oh, I don't get it. Well, that's, that's one reason that we urge people to safely dispose of any medications okay. after you're done with them. So mm-hmm. you have wisdom tooth surgery, mm-hmm. you have a broken ankle, whatever it may be and you have a prescription in your medicine cabinet. So we've been urging people to find ways to dispose of that. And there are a lot of different ways to do that. Mm -hmm. And we have the take back program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a couple times a year that you can bring it and then we dispose of it safely with different relationships uh, with safe disposal companies. We have safe disposal bags that Mm -hmm. we're now giving out at the health department at the CSB, Mm -hmm. different places where you can put them in these little baggies and they will disintegrate in there safely Mm -hmm. and won't be harmful to the environment. And we're working on a new website that all you'll have to do is go in there and you'll be able to see all the pharmacies that are now taking the drugs back from you. Yes, so they're not sitting there in your medicine cabinet because truly that is one of the ways that people are becoming addicted. And when you talk about young people, it's important to remember that most young people don't become addicted to opiates and heroin just by doing that. They started because they might have been drinking alcohol yes, or yes. smoking marijuana. Yes, let's talk about that. Yeah. And so we're not There's a road to that point. Unfortunately, we're not saying that all people who do that will end up using heroin or opiates, but sadly, many of the people who are using did start with mm-hmm. something else mm-hmm. that wasn't perceived to be a problem. I um, I also get a bit concerned about what's uh, going on with social media and young people, the whole definition of what cool is. And uh, very often uh, I have seen websites where cool is actually destructive, self-destructive and destructive behavior, mm-hmm. but not thought about in that way. It's like uh, our young people stay in the moment Mm -hmm. in some circumstances being present is essential but staying in the moment and thinking that's it not looking forward to tomorrow next year or future and the and the consequences that we're seeing uh in families it's it's extraordinary and it's very tragic and when you look at for example the overdose data here in fairfax county alone we are seeing that the number one um cause of or demographic of people overdosing is between 15 and 24 Mm. and so that's absolutely a concern and we need to all work together as a community we can't rely on the csb or the police Mm -hmm. or you know the schools it's got to be all of us (laughs) this is absolutely it's got to be parents and other caring people grandparents aunts uncles neighbors all of us strangers you know um there used to be a time, I don't even know if you're old enough to know this, but I remember 
as a child, if I misbehaved and mom and dad were not around, someone in the community corrected me. Mm -hmm. And by the time I got home, they had already talked to mom and dad. And I had a correction that happened there as well, yeah. which was usually worse. And but they were adults. Yeah. And we as children respected that. And I think respect still exists, but it's taken a different form now. Mm -hmm. uh, we speak to each other differently. And we're not our kids' best friends. No. I'll give you another example. Some of the things we're trying to do at the CSB, one of the things is we created a youth council. Ooh. And these are for young people. We really want to get the word out. This is for young people who are in high school, mm -hmm. um, in even eighth grade, uh, and they can be a part of something bigger and something bigger than themselves or than in their own schools. And they will work on initiatives at the CSB that are about living a clean lifestyle or one without drugs and alcohol. And that's what we're trying to do is send a uh, message to try to combat all the other messages that a lot of teens are getting. And we're also trying to remind teens through a new app that we're working on called Talk They Hear You. This is a brand new campaign we just introduced about a month ago. And this is an app that goes along with a one hour free course that our folks are going out into the field and talking about. And it's about strategies, how to talk to your younger kids about substance use. So this is talk, they hear you, yes. and then you will have professionals talk to adults Yes. on how to talk to their children. Yes. Okay, so it's an intergenerational approach. That's right. We've got the app okay. that you can put on your phone. Okay. So when you find yourself in the moment, you're on a long trip yeah. or you're in a sure. waiting room or you're in line for a concert, you know, yeah. wherever you might be, um, it gives you strategies on how to talk to your children or some young person that you love before they get started with marijuana, other drugs, or alcohol. Because truly, you have to try to stem the issue mm -hmm. early you, yeah. so it won't yeah. be something worse or possibly death or a lifelong struggle right. later. And I, um, I'm thinking about uh, my son and uh, conversations. And I, uh, he didn't come through my womb, but he's in my mind, my son. And this was preteen activity and conversations. And I was trying to figure out a way, how do I get information from him that I want to know about what he's doing? And so I remember saying his name. He said, you know, I want you to help me with a talk I have to give to some young people. And he, I did that, so it was normal. I said, what would you tell him? And he said, well, you know, I'm into sports, and so therefore people don't, you know, try to drag me into drugs or what have you. And then, you know, I said, okay, this is it, this is good. And then he told me, and I was at this party, and, and a bullet went right past my head, at which time I almost wrecked the car, right? Okay, whatever oh you gosh. do, stay cool, listen, 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 you know. And um, what I find interesting is that we as parents, Lucy, have to have coaching to talk to a child that is our own to make a connection, to make the connection where we keep communication open mm -hmm. and honest. We are not accusatory. We're not blaming. Mm -hmm. Lecture, none of that's going to work. Questions can open doors and keep them open. Mm -hmm. Asking as a parent, a son or daughter, help me understand. That's right. You There's know. no book that comes yes. along and you become a parent. There's no book that tells you what to do. And there's also no book that will lead you through infancy, through their 20s and even 30s. I know. And those are a lot of the parents we see where I work. They have a 20-something. Ah. And they're encountering a pretty difficult situation. And they're not sure what to do. A lot of them are afraid to talk to other parents. Ah. So we do have a program called Parent Support Partners. And that's something where parents who have been through this, not only with young kids, but a little bit older kids, too, because they're still kids, unfortunately, sometimes. But they're still our children, no matter what their age. And we have to be thinking about how to talk to them. And we don't just cut them off when they turn 21 and say, see you later. No. Um, these days, we, have, we tend to be more connected to our young adult children. Uh, well into the 
their older parts of their life. And Well, we know, well, let's put it this way, research tells us, you know, we got to age 30 before they're figuring out, one, who they are, and their brain is in a position that can be independent. Uh, sometimes, um, I, I love working with young people because sometimes they're just so unpredictable. Uh, I have learned one of the greatest things I can do is just someone in trouble, acting up, acting out, whatever, early teens, may I have a hug? Oh, that's a good idea. And they look at me first like I'm crazy, but now they know Miss Tyra's not crazy. She's that woman that's going to ask you, is it all right for a hug? Mm -hmm. And something happens to their whole continence. Yeah, Miss Tyra. And some of those hugs are hungry hugs because they want to connect. And we have to, in my opinion, be willing to listen. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the power of touch, just hold a hand mm -hmm. and always asking permission because we know what the world looks like now. You know, you don't mm -hmm. want to impose on their space mm -hmm. or their psyche. But uh, I don't know, Lucy. I, I, I hear you talking about the youth council. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. I it hear is. You. There's a lot of good things happening. Yeah. It's, it's a tough situation that we're seeing, but we really want to get the word out to some of the good things that we're doing. And a lot of people in the past may not have associated the CSB with some of these things. And that's why, as the communications director, I'm just really thrilled to be here and to have an opportunity to talk to people about these different programs. Um, of course, you know, in my role now, we put out news releases. Right, and right. We uh, try to connect with the local board of supervisors uh, folks so they can know and put this information in their newsletters. I'm going to interrupt you again because yeah. this is local board of supervisors, our governance yes. for our county. They're called the board of supervisors. They do issue management at the top level. Mm -hmm. So what Lucy is talking about you know, they're dealing with education, they're dealing with health, they're dealing with clean water. The they're roads. The <laughs> roads, they're dealing yeah. with pl uh, planning of housing, they're dealing with you name it. And if you can get on their agenda, mm -hmm. because they're voting, they, they determine the budget mm -hmm. and what's going to be allocated. So therefore, they're setting priorities. And that's why I believe the conversation, the message is so critical. We've got to push it out. And something I must do right now is push a commercial. Okay. I, I had forgotten about that. We'll be right back. And we are back. I am sitting here with Ms. Lucy Caldwell. She works for Fairfax County. Uh, she's a director of communications. And I don't want to get caught up on her label as much as the initiatives that she's committed to and passionate about. And thus far, we started out, we walked through the door, maybe we just put our toes in the water, actually, of opioid addiction because it is one part of a much larger problem. It can be the consequence of uh, a social contract that's broken with our kids, with adults, uh, expectations that were not met pain and suffering uh, without the skill set to resolve it and have positive alternatives. Uh, opioids are used for suicide. They're used to get high and feel good. Uh, I've heard young women talk about, well, it makes sex less painful. I'm going, like, wow, you know, that's where they're parked. So um, the conversation, I guess what I'm saying is the conversation is like stew or Prego spaghetti sauce, it's in there. Everything we're talking about is mixed up together. And Lucy has shared some wonderful programs coming out of her particular organization that is, uh, well, actually, it's, it's addressing both adults and young people. And I kind of like uh, the app they're developing, Talk, They Hear You. So uh, you may be in a uh, traffic jam sitting there with your your child and uh, there may be some things you want to talk about and this is a good resource for you to have in that situation then there's a youth council uh starting with children from eighth grade uh discussion making i guess making being young a cool thing a healthy thing uh that's that's what to see kids happy and not so serious about 
having the perfect picture on social media or how many hits they got, how many this they got, how many that they got. We want them to understand that they are worthy and that they are not alone. So, Lucy, I'm going to double back. Like I said, this now, is I mean, with the little time we have left, you're going to have to come back. Oh, I'd love to. That'd I'm, be great. I'm going to um, ask Lucy to fantasize. I'm going to pretend like she's a bigger superhero than I believe she is normally and um, ask her to create or to dream or to give us her prescription of how we can break break the direction that we're going, which is like young people taking their own lives. Ouch. Uh, housewives not reporting domestic violence. Ouch. Human trafficking. Ouch. What can we do? We've said it takes a village, but Lucy, superhero, Wonder Woman Lucy, mm -hmm. what would you do uh, to help us locally? And, of course, we know it's not really local. It's global, whatever solutions we come up with. That's right. I, I think that, you know, everybody just taking time to slow down and step back and think about their own actions and think about their own conversations and think about what they can do rather than blaming somebody else or trying to be negative and, and upset and angry and just bursting forth on Twitter or other social media. Mm -hmm. Really think about what's going on and maybe try to just do something very simple. Uh, read some books that can help you along this way. I read a really good book the other day called Option B. And oh. it was just about being positive and... Um, how to overcome difficult trauma. Because as I always say, if you haven't had the trauma yet, you will. Or if your child hasn't, or your parent hasn't, or your best friend hasn't. And what are you going to do about that? And how are you going to help somebody or help yourself through it? And I firmly believe that taking action, just not standing still, and just moving forward. And when Tyra talked about um, if I were the superhero, what I would do is just get folks, hey, talk to your neighbor, check on your neighbor, uh, you know, just knock on the door, take them some banana muffins or, you know, whatever it is, just get to know them. Because I think that we live in, uh, sadly, an epidemic of loneliness and loneliness, we can all play a part in helping ease someone else's loneliness. Absolutely. Uh, and it's easy to live an isolated life. I it don't is. care if you are glued to the TV, if you're glued to social media. At some point, even if you sleep with your phone, you come to the reality that I'm here. Mm -hmm. And you can have someone declared as your loved one next to you and mm -hmm. be lonely. That's true. And and what, what, I, uh, what I like to do is to let people know it's okay to be whoever you are and whatever you're feeling at a given moment. That's right. Don't You can look back, but don't stare. Reach out. And, and I liked uh, taking action, not standing still. I often ask people, what does it cost you to say hello? Right. <laughs> what, how much, how expensive are the words thank you? Right. And... Uh, what what negative thing? What's the worst thing that can happen if you say, how you doing today? Exactly. And I, uh, wow. And I really think it goes a long way, and I've seen that. And if we're doing that, maybe our kids will too. Yes. We're modeling behavior. We Absolutely. are definitely modeling behavior. I, um, mm, I'm so full up of ideas, and, and dear audience, you know me, I get to talking and stuff, and all we have done is crack the door or crack the window to this conversation. Let us hear from you. Email me and, and tell us how you want us to walk further through this door. You, you know uh, that I ask something of each of my guests when they come here because I know the person sitting across from me had a journey to get to where he or she is today. And I asked them to write a letter to their younger self. And do you know something? Oh, Tyra, please, I can't do that. And then somebody, I'm not going to do that. And it's so fun listening to the responses, and yet everybody writes a letter. 
So, Lucy, would you at this time share the letter that you have written? Oh, okay. <laughs> sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dear young Lucy, it'll all be okay. Keep being curious. Keep being passionate and keep caring. Don't let go of your blind faith in others, but know that you may be stomped on a time or two because of it. You will survive and you'll learn. Keep loving your fellow humans. They'll delight and surprise and sustain you more often than not. Stay natural and nurturing your love of nature and the outdoors. Feel the wind in your face and the sweat rolling down your forehead, frozen toes and aching muscles from long hikes in the wilderness. Be alone. Never be afraid of that. It doesn't mean you're lonely. It means you aren't afraid to be with yourself and to use that time to grow. It works. Keep reading books. They'll feed your curious nature and will open doors to ideas and help your spirit remain open too. If you're open, you're able to really listen and learn and that's transcending. Know that bad things are gonna happen to all of us, not always to someone else, but that you'll be tested by them and you'll be okay, you really will. In fact, they'll guide your decisions and actions and steer you where you're supposed to be. That place may not always be pretty or light or carefree, but you'd be bored if it were. You will never be bored. You're creative and you do all you can to keep that creative streak alive. Even if you feel tired, it'll give you the energy you need to do what you want. And you'll find you might be pretty good at it, helping others. No matter what happens, hold your head up. Know you'll be okay, you really will, in strength and in faith, your future self. And she is a very caring and wonderfully warm person. Uh, who you will be hearing from again. Uh, I know her schedule's busy, but because she's committed, I think she'll come back. I'd love to. I um, had a, another request. I've done this twice. Uh, I found a poem uh, that I fell in love with, and it's uh, written by a poet called Sarah Kay, and her book is called Beyond the Wreckage. And this poem is for women, and it's called The Type. I'd like to read it to you. If you grow up the type of woman men want to look at, you can let them look at you. Do not make mistake eyes for hands or windows or mirrors. Let them see what a woman looks like. They may, may never have seen one before. If you grow up the type of woman that men want to touch, and you can let them touch you. Sometimes it's not you they're reaching for. Sometimes it's a bottle, a door, a sandwich, a Pulitzer, another woman. But his hands found you first. Do not mistake yourself for a guardian or a muse or a promise or a victim or a snack. You are a woman, skin and bones, veins and nerves, hair and sweat. You're not made of metaphors. You're not made of apologies, not made of excuses. Woman, if you grow up the type of woman men want to love, you can let them love you. Being loved is not the same as loving. When you fall in love, it is discovering the ocean after years of puddle jumping. It's realizing you have hands. It's reaching for the tightrope when the crowds have all gone home. Do not spend time wondering if you're the type of woman men will hurt. If he leaves you with a car alarm heart, you may learn to sing along. It's hard to stop the ocean, even after it's left you gas gasping, salty. Forgive yourself the decisions you've made, the ones you still call mistakes when you tuck them in at night. And know this. You are the type of woman who's looking for a place to call your own. Let the statues crumble. You have always been the place. You are a woman who can build it herself. You were born to build. Do you let that sing in, sink in? I want to add my own encouragement. You know I call this the spiritual doggy bag for that time in between our next conversation 
when you just say, you know what, Tyra, I am tired. I, in fact, I am tired of being tired. Some of you say, now, child, if you don't get out of here, I'm going to smack you into tomorrow. And then there's some of you that just get quiet and don't say a word. I want you to understand something. This is so important. If you get confused and don't understand why you're feeling the way you feel, and if that feeling is less than, when you're in doubt, check your label. You're not a markdown. You are a designer's original. God has set your value. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Surround yourself with people who can remind you of who you were created to be. And hear me now. You are not alone. You are not your circumstances. Nothing that has happened to you in your life will be wasted. The good, the bad, the scary. It's all working together. You have everything you need within you to thrive. Say yes to the power that's within you. And remember, everyone needs a place, but it shouldn't be inside someone else. I've had a wonderful conversation with Miss Lucy Caldwell from Fairfax County Community Services Board. She'll be back. Thank as you. Will I. I'm going to have us enjoy the feeling that the music brings to your ears. Remember, your seat is guaranteed at the table. All you have to do is tune in. You've been listening to Radio Fairfax.